Welcome back to Movie Guys Improvise, the MGI podcast you are listening to. Chill with Realms. Jurassic Mark. And Farhad Targaryen. Last week, we reviewed the 2002 miniseries Dinotopia. We all agree that that was a very high bar to leave the podcast on. So if you have not seen our review of it yet, go ahead and check out Dinotopia, the miniseries. All three episodes are right on YouTube, so it's very accessible. Once you've caught up on that, then watch our review of it. For today's episode, we're continuing the theme of this season of the podcast, which is miniseries, television series. This week is another Netflix TV show. It's a Netflix original based on a movie called Dear White People. I've seen this show before. I brought it up as today's episode because I wanted to review it with you guys. I've seen the whole show already, seasons one, two, and three. Season one, I think, might be the best, one of the best, if not the best, but I haven't seen the movie. JM, I think you said you have seen the movie before, correct? Yep, that's correct. Cool. Now, before we do our deep dive into the review itself, I brought up this show, like the first time I brought this show up to you guys was when I was referencing that one episode in Never Have I Ever, where it was from a different character's perspective than the usual main character. It was a different protagonist. So that's basically how this entire show was, where basically pretty much every single episode has its own main character. So just with the structure of the show, how did you guys feel about that with the presentation? I felt pretty good about it coming into this show because they set the structure that way. It would have been tougher for me to accept it in Never Have I Ever because they did five straight episodes with one character and then they jumped into another character on the sixth episode, which kind of worried me. But with shows that jump around to different characters from the start, it's a lot easier for me to vibe with it. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. I was just going to say, I love that this was an ensemble piece. And the fact that so many different points of view were taken into account really emphasized the show's themes of perception and uh, multiplicity of voices. I liked that it was told from so many different perspectives because perspective seems like the main thrust of the series, or at least one of the central concerns. Right, yeah. And of course television and film are two different mediums, related mediums, but they're still two different ways of storytelling. So what I wanted to ask is the way the show took every episode as a different character's perspective, did the movie do anything like that? Or was Sam like the main character throughout the entire thing? I would say Sam was the main character, but it was still an ensemble story because we did spend a lot of time with Lionel with Troy and with these other characters. I actually got a chance to take a look at the movie too. The biggest thing with me, like I, I enjoyed the movie, but the biggest thing for me was seeing um the actor Tyler. He's uh, the same actor that does Chris from Everybody He's Chris. He's playing Lionel in this movie. And it was weird for me to see him in that role because he's a straight man as far as I've you know seen him in in any other roles. So it was like uh, nothing bad about it is like props to him to be able to to act that out and for me it was just like damn like I never expected it like to, to actually see him branch into a role like that I remember that actor best from the walking dead honestly there were memes when he died they were saying like everybody ate Chris <laughs> uh, <I did> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> So, Realms, you actually caught up with the show and you watched the movie. Yes. Okay. And, yeah, I, I was saying just now that I do uh, recognize the actor from other places as well. But from the conversations I've had with y'all two off the record, I think we can all agree that Lionel is our favorite, right? Most dev. Oh, totally. Yeah, Lionel is the best. I relate to him the most basically because... He can be kind of socially awkward. And the actor who portrays him 
portrays his social awkwardness so convincingly, you know? I, I wish I could explain it more eloquently, but that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah, honestly, I like the the new line that we have for the for the movie because I'm I'm still used to seeing Tyler in different roles. So for me, it wasn't a fit for me, but it was great to see that he made an appearance within the series. That was dope. For sure, yeah. And yeah, think I haven't seen the movie, but I feel like yeah, Tyler James Williams would be like it would be a good in this role of Lionel as well, assuming that like the character is like pretty much the same between the movie and the show. Yeah, he was definitely decent. For me, it's just uh, my my headspace with seeing him in different roles was what messed it up for me. Not you. Okay, he is a good actor, though. I think. Yeah. Both. Yeah, both Tyler James Williams. <laughs> and Deron Horton, who plays Lionel on the show. So getting into the show itself, it's kicked off with a blackface party that was technically hosted by a newspaper on campus called Pastiche. The Mm -hmm. campus we're talking about is Winchester University. I don't think it's a real university, but there there is a college, an institution called University of Winchester, but I think it's in Europe, so it's definitely not the same like university that we're seeing in the show. Yeah, it's supposed to be one of the Ivy League schools. Oh yeah, it's definitely Ivy League, that's for sure. Well, though, like they they explicitly say it a couple of times, but um, yeah, I guess that would put it somewhere in the Northeast. I don't know, maybe New England. Oh, I didn't catch that they actually said that it was Ivy League, but it just looked very Ivy mm-hmm. League to me, you know. Yeah, I wonder where they shot this, actually, because I'm curious about the set. That absolutely looked like a real school. True, true. Yeah, I'm curious about that, too. Now, oh, I'm kind of regretting not looking that up before um, we started recording this. <laughs> Homework for the audience. There we go. <laughs> um, but what uh, something else that I can't say just about the, the setting of the show in general, I felt like the show was very cinematic, you know, and I really liked that a lot, like just the cinematography itself, it was filmed very movie-like. And I really appreciated that. Maybe it was just like the TV that I watched it on, but I'm just saying what the show looked like presentation-wise. Maybe it's just me. No, I I think a lot of the Netflix shows have that same quality because the others that we've watched for this podcast have had similar aesthetics, I want to say. You know, um, like... uh, uh, superhero show we watched crap uh, i'm not okay with this looked very cinematic um and uh never have i ever looked very cinematic so i wonder if that's a brand thing so yeah i am not okay with this did kind of seem movie like as well but i don't know maybe it's because i was watching the show in a different setting on a different tv is why i feel this way um but it just felt a little more movie like movie yeah movie like than the other Netflix originals that we reviewed this season. I'm not okay with this. And also, never have I ever. Could just have been the television for all I know. Yeah. It definitely could be the TV because I know there's like some TVs, um, whenever I see a show played on it, it'll have kind of like a soap opera look to it. Yes. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's mm. like the frame rate is so fresh and smooth that it looks like yeah. you're watching something happen live. For, yeah, for a better way. Yeah, yeah. As like I'm the one that, holding the camera, <laughs> as opposed to that sort of washed out color you get with older TVs. Word, word. Yeah, but it definitely did match up with the movie in terms of mm-hmm. quality. Like it was on, when I when I went back and watched the movie, I did see some scenes that were redone that had um maybe a little bit more of a cinematic feel to it, like a a, a little bit more of a higher quality, but it wasn't too far off. One difference between the show and the film that I'd love to get your opinions on is that if I remember correctly, and I haven't seen the movie in like five years, but if I remember correctly, the movie spends more time talking about Sam's interest in film, like as a medium. And I kind of missed that just a little bit in the show, but I'm curious to hear what you guys think. I think Sam's love of film is more of a focus in season three of the show. Okay, because I've only watched season one. Yeah, they definitely did touch on her her film later in the show, but a lot more in the movie than in season one. 
Well, I remember her in the movie complaining about having to go through something called Tarantino week in one of her classes. I love that the, the movie does kind of give a little bit more of a backstory towards um, leading up to where the actual party happened. Hmm. Well, the party was the climax of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like when you jump straight into the series, the move, the, the party kind of came out of nowhere. Hmm. Yeah, it was the launch point. So are you saying that the move, are you saying that the party that happened in episode five was how mm-hmm. the movie ended? That was like the third act of the movie? Yeah. Oh, wait. Uh, we're talking about the party at the beginning of the series, though, not the party where Reggie almost got shot. No, no, no. The party at yeah. the beginning of the series. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the F, uh, yeah F, uh, FT. The, the movie be, uh, ended with the blackface party. Oh, okay. And then the show began right where the movie left off. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, okay. But they did have slight differences, I noticed. Um, in the movie, it was the Dear White People Party, but then in the series, it was Dear Black People. Well, and Troy's dad, I think, had a different job in the movie. I think he was only like the assistant dean or something like that in the movie, but in the show, it looks like he's the head honcho. Right, right. Did they even show... Uh, what's What's the head of Prestige's character? Kurt. Okay. Did they even show his father in the first season? I don't I don't think they did, right? I don't think so. Okay, because they showed him in the movie. Yeah, and we saw know. that in the movie, Troy was dating, I think, the white dean's daughter for a little while, and it was framed as being a chess move on Troy's dad's part. Right. I don't think they show Kurt's dad at all throughout the whole show. Yeah, I don't think so the movie ends with the blackface party, but that's the premise. That's what gets the show started, the the TV version anyway. So Sam is there. Like we were just talking about Sam's love of filming. She's there filming the blackface party to bring shame to the Winchester campus. And the, the, whole, the whole show starts off with how so many people are pissed off, rightfully so, about such a thing even happening. Uh, some of the characters, Sam is basically the main character of the show. Like She's the protagonist of the first episode. We get to see several more after that. And even though I have seen this series before, a lot of things happened that I actually completely forgot about. For example, when Gabe took a picture of Sam without her knowing and posted it on Instagram, hashtag hated when Bay leaves. I completely forgot that that happened, but he acts so like blissfully ignorant about that saying he wasn't aware as like an out of touch millennial that that's how news spreads i don't know i don't think i would buy that as a explanation i think he was doing that to i think he was being selfish honestly he was doing that to like put her in a spot like backing her into a corner where she's kind of forced to accept it you know i mean obviously she has feelings for him too so eventually she's fine with it but i don't I don't think that was okay, what Gabe did. Yeah, it definitely didn't seem like the best move as far as what he was trying to do initially. Because somebody, some people aren't going to be as receptive to it being blown up like that without their permission. Yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. how all of her friends find out that she's dating someone white. Knowing who she is, he should have been more considerate with that. That's true. Yeah, but yeah. Gabe is quite the ignorant dude we're going to talk more about the stuff he's done later on in the podcast but just wanted to expand a little bit upon lionel because by the end of the first episode i think it was by the end of the first episode is when lionel comes to sam and says he knows that it's because of her that there were so many people that showed up to the blackface party and he says to her that he doesn't want to tell other people's truths we were just talking about the dean too he kind of had a problem with with sam doing that but i kind of understand what sam was doing you know like people basically i think what sam was doing was showing how there were like sleeping racists at this university the fact that so many people showed up which she even says she's she's at the the studio right the recording studio on campus and she's watching the footage she recorded and she says 
so many people showed up, people that she invited, you know, and she's kind of horrified at that. I kind of, I'm kind of on her side about it, you know, the fact that people showed up, the fact that people did that, um, it just goes to show how disgusting people are on that campus. Yeah, well, I know the movie ended with a montage of actual parties like that that have happened in real life at colleges. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I guess it is kind of like a reflection of reality in this case, unfortunately. Yeah, I saw a lot of dates from 2011, 2012, 2013 area. But Troy's father tries to prepare him in this way because it seems like he knows being black that he has to work twice as hard to reach the same levels that white people can. So he, he gets invited to all these you know, insider parties with higher ups. Most of the people there are seemingly old, rich white people, which is exactly what uh, the Dean is preparing Troy for. Corporate America, I guess that's one way of putting it. But I think the show gets more and more interesting as they introduce new characters and new perspectives per every single episode. A lot of the Coco episode was in flashback, we saw how she was practically best friends with Sam until they have a disagreement over something. Honestly, I completely forgot what exactly it was that they fought over. Do you guys remember what that was? Colorism was a bone of contention between the two of them, and I'm not at all qualified to speak about that, but I remember that was part of it. I know I know. another tension they had was between the fact uh, of Troy. Really? They, they had... They... They had tension over each other because of Troy? I don't know if it was like a spoken tension, but I know when Coco seen Troy with her, that bothered her. So another thing that drove them apart was, and this was in the movie too, Coco was at that party and Sam filmed her kind of defending it. Like, I don't know if you guys remember that scene. I do. Yeah. Yeah. She was All at right. like, the Dear Black People party. Yeah. And then she posted it on the radio show and she did the auto tune over her voice. I, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Damn. I remember. She was that. like, this bitch had the nerve to auto tune me. <laughs> Ran up to the station. What up? As a side note, I feel like Joelle is kind of a main character too, even though she didn't have an episode dedicated to her, at least not in the first season. Her role got bigger as the season went on. That's true. She, yeah, she definitely became more and more important. But especially in season one, she oftentimes came off to me as the voice of reason to mm -hmm. several characters. She was the voice of reason to Sam. She mm -hmm. was the voice of reason to Reggie. And she was the voice of reason to Gabe. Yeah. I'm actually surprised. I thought um, her and Gabe were actually going to end up together at one point. Really? When they started hanging out more. Wait, wait, they were they were hinting at them two getting together? No, I thought they were going to end up getting together because they started hanging out more. Oh, okay, okay. Gotcha. So I got to admit, when Reggie and Gabe first met, I couldn't tell why Reggie was so like angry with Gabe. Was it just, was it more than just jealousy? Because we know that he has a thing for Sam, but Sam is with Gabe. So was he just being harsh with him just because of jealousy? Or was there something more than that? Would, did Gabe actually say anything offensive? I remember they were watching TV and, you know, it was something brutal. And Gabe was saying that he was just as angry as Reggie. And Reggie said that's impossible. And that's kind of, and then after that is when they started arguing and Gabe just leaves. But I couldn't tell, like, was, did Gabe actually say something that was out of line or was it purely... What, what do you guys think? Was it purely just jealousy? Mm. <laughs> no, no matter what he said, I feel like he would have got, I guess, he would have caught some shit from Reggie because Reggie, he was already mad in general. And then him walking in with Sam was just icing on the cake. I see. I see. That makes sense. Okay. So Reggie's episode, I would say, is the turning point of the show itself. It's episode five. We can even technically call it the mid-season finale. Off the record, when I was talking to you guys, I was saying we can, you know, review the first five episodes, like half the season or the whole season. I feel like, you know, if we ended it on episode five, we would have 
like pretty strong feelings of it. You know, like like I talked to you guys, even the season finale ends on technically a cliffhanger anyway. But that party, the party in like when when we were talking earlier about how the movie ended, I thought you guys were talking about this party, about this party at Addison's house. I think that's the character's name. I think so. Yeah, his his white friend for trivia night was that the guy? It's happening at his house. Yeah. Everybody's having a good time. They're having yeah, they're playing beer trivia. I think like whoever loses has to keep taking shots. That's what the game was. So <laughs> Regina Addison win. It's all good. They play music and everybody's dancing. Everybody's having a good time until the N word appears in the song and Addison sings along to it. And Reggie was like, "Whoa, don't say that." And that makes Addison really uncomfortable. I don't get that though. He's, Reggie's not asking for much and he's also not calling you a racist. You know, he, why did he have to be so turned off about that? I mean, I get that's the point of the episode, but I'm just saying it's, it's realistic. Like it, it's very believable that such a thing could happen. So I'm saying this in a realistic setting. Why is it so hard for you to just I don't know, replace that word with another word when it comes up in a song, okay? I'm sure you guys know by now, I'm a really big Weekend fan. Hell, I'm the number one Weekend fan, if I might say so myself. One of my favorite things to do is to listen to his music. He says the N-word in a lot of his songs. I don't say it. I replace it with another word, or I'll just skip the beat, depending on the lyric. I replace the word with sinner. Like I'll either not say it or I'll just replace it with sinner. It's impossible to be a human being and not be a sinner. Like we're all sinners, so I just say sinner. Right. Um, yeah. And I also listen to a lot of rap music. Realms. We used to listen to a lot of rap music together in high school. Yes, sir. <laughs> so why can't someone else do it? You know? I, I just, I genuinely couldn't understand why Addison had to, he, his mood was totally killed. You know, everybody else is dancing. Reggie just said, oh, don't say that. And Addison feels like defending himself. First, he says, I guess it feels kind of weird to censor myself. Reggie responds by saying, felt kind of weird to hear you say it. And I agree. I got to be honest. It always feels weird to me when white people feel like just say the word nonchalantly. It's always been weird to me. But aside from that, I don't get why he had to be so turned off by it. And he was accusing Reg at that point of calling him a racist. And Joel had to step in and say, no one's calling you a racist. Just don't say that word. I don't get it. I don't know why he, he had to be so offended by that. Probably a mix of things. Yeah, it's probably a mix of things partially the white privilege I, I i took it as seeing the the way he was singing the song he's probably said the word plenty of times in the past and nobody's told him to stop before because he never had an issue with it no yeah. then on top of that um you know he's got alcohol in the system and it's supposed to be his boy reggie and yeah, just helped him win you know, the trivia contest that they were having and now he's calling him out in front of everybody seemingly everybody but like nobody's really paying attention to them but when you're drinking sometimes something small can trigger into something so much bigger yeah. well reggie had alcohol in his system too and reggie was trying to be nice about it you know he was just saying don't say that i mean everybody had alcohol in their system you know it's not like he was the only drunk person there it was probably a lot of defensiveness on addison's part you know, like he, he freaked out, I guess, you know, he preemptively assumed that they were calling him a racist and just lost his cool immediately. And for the record, he was 110% in the wrong. Like, I want to make that clear. Yeah. He was in infinitely percent in the wrong. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you, you, you don't say that if you're not, if you're not a member of that community. Or at least, at least if you're going to say that, like, at least know, you know, your audience, know who you can and cannot say it around. Some people, they may not care. Then I guess you can say it around them. But if somebody asks you, yo, like, I don't feel comfortable with that, then you, you should listen. Yeah. No, Reggie, was, Reggie was telling him, 
I'm not comfortable with you saying that. You know, if if Addison was really his friend, you'd think he would back down and apologize and say something like, "Oh my God, I'm so sorry." But instead, he he doubled down and got angrier. Yeah, it should have been it from there. It should have been like, "All right, I respect what you're saying. I won't do it." JM, you saying that he felt like Reggie was calling him a racist before he actually called him a racist. No, but like nobody said that from the get go. Like Edison was saying, but I'm uh, I'm not a racist just because I said that. That's when Joel stepped in to say, "No one's calling you a racist. Just don't say that word. It's okay. Like you didn't know before that it's not cool for you to say it. Now you know. There, problem solved." But he was still hung up on it, you know. Yeah. So, well, at that point, agree. he had already he had already presumed that they thought that, and so now that feeling is still lodged in there that he's working through throughout the scene. Mm. Like, even though she says, oh, nobody's calling you a racist, like, he's still thinking low-key they may be thinking that. Or somebody around them might be thinking that. Yeah, I suppose that's how his mind was working at that point. And JM, I agree with you what you were saying before in that. And uh, Realms, you, you can feel free to correct me. You know, you have every right to correct me. The general consensus that I've come to is that if you are not black, you do not get to participate in the conversation of who gets to say it and who doesn't get to say it. Like you have no say, basically, you know, like some people might be cool with saying it. Some people might not be. But if you are not black, then that question just doesn't concern you. Just don't say it at all. Anybody can say anything they want to say as long as they understand that there may be repercussions if you say it around the wrong people. You have the freedom of speech, but not the freedom of consequences. All right. So that wasn't it for the party. Anyway, somebody pushed Reggie and he like he he by accident started pushing Addison and then they started fighting. Someone called the cops, the police showed up and they saw like the cops just saw Reggie and Addison fighting and was only asking for Reggie's ID and Reggie cusses at them and then gets a gun pointed at his face. And this, I mean, this is an example of, you know, the, the reality that unfortunately, unfortunately a lot of black people have to face in this country and even worldwide. Like what, what, provoked the police officer to think that he needed a gun to protect himself just because Reggie was cursing at him. Like Reggie doesn't suddenly become a threat to you physically if he curses at you. I didn't understand that. I mean, I still like, it's, it's mind boggling that the world is like this anyway, but the, fa the fact that that happened, it just, it doesn't make sense. Like, logically speaking, it doesn't make sense. That's just the police officer, a racist police officer, obviously using excessive force. The craziest thing was, you know, he's trying to break up this fight and find out, you know, if Reggie's a student. Meanwhile, the kid that he's fighting literally stops fighting him and, and he's saying, hey, I can vouch for him. Like, he does go to the school. And yet he still aimed and on to Reggie. That was the craziest part. If Addison were a true friend, then he would have said to the police officer, like, wait, stop, stop. He, he, I can, I can vouch for him. He goes to the school and I'll show you my ID too. There, you know, I've, I've like, Ad Addison seemed to like, just let it happen. You know, I also don't think we see Addison ever again in seasons one, two or three after this can't remember if we see him at all no, I, I think that was one yeah i think that was the only time we saw him i i will say the fact that that he stood up and he was like yo like yeah he does go to the school that was a very decent thing to do in that moment you know of having the gun pointed at the party and everything everybody's in shock so i can't i, I won't hold it against him that he didn't you know that he couldn't think of what further to do at that moment Oh, did Addison actually do that? I must have. Yeah, yeah. He said, he told him that Reggie actually went to the school. But for some reason, they still, you know, continued on trying to, like, he continued to be the focus. 
because because he cursed he said fuck them pigs or fuck these pigs i think that's what reggie said and that's when he got a gun pointed in his face and this sets the course of the rest of the show basically another big part of that episode is who was the one who dialed 911 right so ultimately it's revealed that gabe is the one who dialed 911 and the show made it look like lionel was the one who dialed 911 um, but then when the cop shows up and throws the gun in Reggie's face, Gabe freaks out and is like, why do you have guns? And I'm thinking like, whoa, they're campus police. Why would they not have guns? Why would he think, why would anyone think that campus police would not have firearms on them? I personally didn't know. I didn't go to, you know, a mean college, like a, a university type or anything like that. I went to the community college and I never really had a run in with any security on there so i was never 100 percent sure if they usually have it or not campus security is different from campus police though we're talking about mm-hmm. police officers i don't know why is, is it a thing like jam do you know I'm, I'm pretty sure stony brook pd had guns on them all the time i can't speak to stony brook but i also used to live in lawrence kansas which is where the university of kansas is located and that's a small town with a big college. And I know the college had its own full-fledged police department. I'm pretty sure those guys had firearms. I don't know if they would have brought them to a frat party, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the PD on campus did have firearms, but I can't remember what the situation was at Stony Brook. Okay, I can't remember, but I do feel like campus police at Stony Brook did have that. So, which I do want to hit you guys with a quick little anecdote. There was one time where I was working on campus and I was working late, like I was working at the residential computing centers and the late shift ended at 2.30, which makes sense because college students, we stay up for a long time, right? So it makes sense because people would show up until like that late. But anyway, I worked in a dorm that was all the way on the other side of campus. So once my shift was over, I had a long way home, back to my dorm room. So I shut down the computer lab and I put my headphones on late at night so I can't hear any of my surroundings. And I'm walking back to my dorm and all of a sudden there's this light shining on the left side of my face and I turn my head and it's a cop in a car shining his flashlight in my face. So I take my headphones off, he's talking to me. He's like, are you a student here? I'm like, yes. And he's like, do you have ID? And I'm like, yes. And he's like, can I see it? So I did that. Like, I just pulled out my ID and I showed it to him. And he's like, all right, thank you. Have a good night. I can't remember if he reached his hand out to like, like take it and look at it. Or if he just looked at it in my hand. That I don't remember. But I felt really, it, it felt so weird that a cop would ask me, do I go to this school? I mean, it's not like, it, it was 2.30 in the morning. So it's not like the whole campus was was teeming with people walking all around but there are always people walk, like a few people walking around here and there because the library is always open there are food places still open so people are and of course there are parties so there will always be people late at night on a college campus walking around sometimes i don't know why unless someone dialed 911 on campus and i looked like someone suspicious i did have pink hair <laughs> so maybe that was why I looked suspicious. I don't know, but I'm sure I wasn't the only person on campus who also had their hair dyed pink. Well, maybe not pink, but I'm just saying that was a weird run-in that I had with the police when I went to Stony Brook. That red flag comes out when they see that pink hair, bro. (laughs) Red flag for pink hair. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Anyway, so... Hey, did they did they have like a, a history of like vandalism or anything at that school or something? Like, because thinking back to shows um, such as Fresh Prince, I know they had episodes where rival teams would go to the other team's school and try to vandalize stuff before the game or stuff, or uh, to throw them off, stuff like that. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. JM, do you know if like Stony Brook had a history of vandalism or anything like that? Not that I can recall. I do remember my first semester, some asshat pulled the fire alarm like 11 times in maybe four weeks. What? 
I'm serious. Like twice or thrice a week, always at like 11 or 12 at night, we all had to get out onto the lawn because somebody had pulled the fire alarm. But uh, I don't remember any vandalism incidents. At all rates, I'm I'm really sorry that that happened to you, man. Oh, yeah, no, it was okay. Like, it was weird, but I, I did feel a tad bit of, you know, racial profiling there, even though there were at my time at Stonerbrook, there were a lot of brown people on campus. So even then, it just felt weird that that happened at all, you know, but I've always remembered that it happened, but it didn't like scar me, you know, because it wasn't traumatizing to the level that it happened to Reggie, you know, like Reggie will probably be unfortunately traumatized for life that a gun was pointed in his face. Yeah, you always, you always run in, you always remember those weird run-ins with the police, because I know me and my brother have had a few that made no sense at all. There was uh, one time I had a friend over, we were hanging out, and this was one of my, my brother. He's not my blood brother, but uh, one of my best friends. He was living at my house at the time. He came back from work. So he takes uh, the friend that I had over back to her house. I'm riding with them. We drop her off, but as we're driving to her house, there's a car that's following us from damn near my house, all almost all the way to her house, which was maybe 15 minutes away. And we had to cross like through, a, we had to go on a, one of the main roads and then go through a lot of turns in the back road and they're following us the whole way. They pass us as we turn into her driveway, drop her off, we wait for a minute and then we start heading back and maybe five minutes up the road, they start following us again. They follow us all the way back to my place. And at that point, we're thinking, okay, we're not gonna lead some crazy ass person back to my mother's house. Like what the, no, that's, that's not happening. So we're already thinking, all right, we're just gonna drive past the house and start driving towards police station. You wanna follow us to the police station? Go right ahead. And <laughs> as we're, leaving my road now suddenly he's got his lights on it's an undercover cop and there's another cop coming from uh the right direction to block us off and they pull us over and they're trying to ask us uh if we have drugs on us and all this weird ass shit and they do it a lot because my brother has a red car they target his car that's what they said. It's because of because you were driving a red car. No, that's why. they don't. They don't say that. But he's gotten pulled over a lot of times because of that. Oh, okay. All right. So, wait. So he, your brother, was saying he gets pulled over a lot because he drives a red car. He does. I've been in the car numerous yeah. times with him, and we're not doing anything, and we just get pulled over. Yeah, I've heard statistically that happens to red cars more than cars of any other color. I don't know why what? it's something it's something weird and psychological but I think the cops think anybody who's driving a red car must be a speed demon or something. What? Yeah, he's he's got a newer model car like a it's a a black car. He doesn't get pulled over anymore as much as they did before. I don't I don't even remember him telling me at all that he's been pulled over in that vehicle. Now they're they're asking us, "Oh, where are the drugs at? Like do you guys have drugs on you and all this shit?" And we're like no, what, what are you talking about? They're asking where you live. I said, right up the road. I said, if you want to, we can wake my mother up right now and y'all can talk to her. As soon as I tell them you can wake up my mother, now they want to drop the issue. They don't want to do that. <laughs> they don't want to wake her up. Now they want to let it go. So they're, I don't know. Jeez. At the very least, wouldn't it be nice to at least get an apology? Like, they wasted your time. You're, you're on your brother's time. Couldn't they have at least said, okay, sorry for bothering you. Have a good night or something. They just wasted your time. And that's your problem. They, they wasted that on 20, 30, however long, you know, you guys had to deal with that. And that's time you're never going to get back because of them. And you did nothing wrong. You were just tr transporting yourself to your mom's house. That's it. Yep. I'm getting freaked out by being followed by an undercover cop. There's no way for us to know this is an undercover cop. So obviously we're going to not head home and bring danger to the house. So I don't know. Well, I'm sorry that happened to you and your bro, man. Yeah, it's terrible. <sighs> it is what it is. You know? I'm, I've, I've come to terms with it. I'm over it. 
at this point in my life, that was years ago. But it's just sad that stuff like that happens. And thankfully, it didn't go to the extreme of, you know, Reggie's situation where guns are pulled out. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So I'm going going back to this. Yeah. So like, I guess, I guess we're, um, for, for me anyway, like, I, I would expect campus police to have guns, but as the story progresses, uh, the next episode, I think it's dedicated to Sam again, and she really, really feels for Reggie, like, she really feels for him, to the point where, by the end of that episode, we see, we see, you know, another side to Reggie, not only is he a tech whiz, because he came up with that woke app, right? Uh, which was cool for sure um but he's also kind of a poet i thought his poem was really touching um but by the end of the episode sam decides to cheat on gabe with reggie and i wonder and i want you guys i really want your guys opinion on this as that episode was closing it was supposed to close at like um there was supposed to be a pep rally and then there was going to be um a protest at the pep rally that didn't end up happening, but did end up happening was Sam sleeping with Reggie right when Gabe is calling. By the very last frame of the episode, she looks into the camera. I'm wondering if you guys think, was that just done for dramatic effect? Or did the actress slip up and look into the camera and the director just went with it? It's hard to tell. With this series, they can get away with it, honestly, if it's a slip up, because they've done it numerous times intentionally true honestly guys i don't think sam did the right thing there definitely not no and i i was like how the hell are you gonna do that when everybody is going to a protest that you set up and you're gonna miss out on it to screw over somebody wow yeah her reasoning for that was she needed to be sure of what she wanted. But I think that makes, that's kind of bad because, okay, so in order to know what you want, you have to cheat on someone who is your SO right now. You know, that mm. still doesn't really make it okay. You know? That definitely sounds like rationalizing on Sam's part. Like she realized she did something messed up and tried to come up with an excuse for it later. At least that's the way I saw it. If you're unsure, hey, break it up. Give them a chance to, yeah. you know, make that decision. Hey, they know that you decided you wanted to test the waters elsewhere. If they still want to be with you, then, you know, it's meant to be. But to do that in secrecy, that's extra fucked up. Yeah. But Sam didn't find out that Gabe was the one who called the cops until after she cheated on him mm -hmm. like she slept with reggie and then she spent time with gabe again and then the next morning after that is when lionel leaked the 911 call yeah it hmm. definitely didn't help uh, gabe's case in yeah. terms of getting her back but i still don't even understand why he would even want to be back with her but i for me personally that would have been it for me but i guess she the one for him Oh, I see. So, like, the whole once a cheater, always a cheater sort of thing? Not necessarily once a cheater, always a cheater, but more so, I mean, you cheated on me. So, it's like, I, at that point, it's like, I, I can't trust you right now. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, this, it, it, they were both technically being kind of dishonest with each other um, because Gabe wasn't telling her what he did. And she found out through a leak. So we find out, the audience finds out when Gabe confesses to Joel. And I thought Joel was really, really being patient with him. And I think she was looking out for him too, because her immediate reaction was, well, not her immediate reaction, but she eventually, like she was saying to him right quick, you cannot tell Sam. She finds out, you just, you just can't tell her. And she was saying that because it's, it seems to me that, that she cares about them as a couple. She knows that they really care for each other and they want each other to be okay. That's the only reason why she was advising him not to tell her. Otherwise, she knew it would ruin things between them. At least that's the way I saw it. But Yeah, Joelle definitely seems like 
a keeper of the peace in a lot of situations. Like she, she, she seems to enjoy, or at least have a knack for diffusing tension between the people she cares about. Oh, I told him the same thing. You'd be a whole dumbass to confess about that, knowing her. <laughs> but damn, Lionel. <laughs> he yeah. Came through, yeah. He came through with the hex. Well, this, this makes me want to talk about Lionel again, because A, how the hell did he get that 911 call? You got to be like some insane level hackery to be able to get that good quality of a 911 call. How do you even do that? Okay, firstly. And secondly, whatever happened to him saying he doesn't want to tell other people's truths. In the first episode, he consulted with Sam saying, Sam, I know what you did, but you know, I don't want to be telling people for you. You should tell them yourself, essentially something like that. But he didn't wait for Gabe. He just broke the news without coming to Gabe. I mean, Gabe ends up being mad at Lionel later on. But if, if Lionel really believes in not exposing other people like that, when they can do it themselves, then why did he do it to Gabe? Question, question. Did he know that it was Gabe when he, when he first played it? Mm. He might it not have. Thing, it could just be a thing, you know, ain't nobody he, he expected to know, though. So it's, it's different when it comes to exposing friends and exposing somebody you don't know. And then at the same time, even if he did know it was Gabe, uh, I don't, he's not as close with Gabe as he is with Sam. So that could be another reason. Yeah, Lionel and Gabe are both kind of introverted characters. And when we see them together, they're usually just sitting in the background. So I don't think they would have spoken to each other very much. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I mean, he's still he's still exposing somebody and going like he's he's being yeah. contradictory. But at the same time, it's like, for a lot of people, it's a different story depending on how close you are with people. Well, Lionel's also under a lot of pressure from his newspaper to deliver the news as the paper wants it delivered, which is, you know, to maximize scandal as long as it doesn't scandalize the wrong people. Oh, true, true. So his, his editor might have actually put him up to it the more I think about it. So more on Gabe, though, that, like, I really didn't appreciate. So... One's like right when the call is leaked, Sam gets up and leaves. Like they're together, Sam leaves and he's crushed. He's just calling her constantly and he goes straight to AP. Man, don't you think it's a good idea to just give her some space? Like, what do you think is going to happen if you go over there? You know, like he goes there and the like all like everybody there glares at him. And I think, was it Al who asked, Why are you even here? Or maybe it was Reggie who asked. And he says, for her, meaning for Sam, yeah. like, bro, you don't you know to just like give her some time and wait it out? Like, why would you think going there right then and right then and there would be such a good idea? I didn't I didn't agree with Gabe doing that right then and there, to be honest. He was in his feelings. He was probably just, I don't know, just not thinking straight. Hopeless romantic. One, he was trying to make a grand apology. And he was yeah. trying to show he didn't care who was around. <laughs> he, he, Not that it worked, though. He might have also thought that he could apologize to all the black students and Reggie at the same time and clearly miscalculated. True, true. That's a good point as well, Jam. So that's also like while, while he was there, that's when he took the time to first berate Lionel for a little bit and then accuse Sam basically of cheating on him with Reggie, which is, ends up that he's right about. And Sam starts to feel bad about it, realizing that she made a terrible mistake doing what she did. But I honestly can't understand right now, like if she meant that she did that because she needed to be sure about what she wanted. So she did that, she had sex with Reggie. And right after that, what? Like she decided, okay, she had sex with Reggie and she doesn't want to be in a relationship with him. Is that like, I, don't, I guess I don't really know how that works or how her mind works, but I just didn't really fully understand that logic. I know in the movie, not so much in the first season of the show anyway, but in the movie, the fact that Sam is with a white person is something that sort of picks at her conscience a little bit because she's... She, the movie implies that she feels 
like she's got a bit of a chip on her shoulder because she's biracial. And one of the other characters in the movie said, well, you keep, it's, it's like you need to be extra black. I think somebody says in the movie and yeah. maybe there's a part of her that's always felt guilty about dating a white man on those grounds. Hold up. Hold up. Is she biracial in the movie? Yeah. Yeah. And in the show. Yeah, I, I know she's biracial in the show, but like, why would she feel so guilty? Like, if if one of her parents is black and one of her parents are white, like, you know, her her lineage is literally that. So why? I mean, I also don't know what it's like to be biracial like that. So I don't I guess I wouldn't understand why she would have that conflict. But you know, not that I would know how that feels. I'm just saying, because of her surroundings, like she she's at a at, at a campus where you know there's a a group of you know black students and they kind of have a chip on their shoulder about stuff like that so it, it influences her to be a certain way or to to think a certain type of way yeah she's definitely okay. a leader like she she's a leader of everything that's that's been wrong and she wants to do something about it so in that respect she's definitely like a basically like a civil rights leader on campus which is why yeah. kurt and pastiche hate her so much yeah and it's it's got a lot to do with the way that she's behaved in the past the the stature that she's created for herself before she met gabe so now it's like you know she's been preaching all this stuff even um her best friend says and she says I think it was a reference to the movie. There was um, a book that a little, what was it a, a web story that she made and it had a rating on there and it was, it said something on there about them needing to cater more to the, to their brothers as opposed to, you know, interracial dating. Like she said, she said something like that on her own and people, you know, they look up to her, they follow that and now they see her going against what she said. Mm. this was in the movie you're saying right that portion about the um the web story that she made okay okay fun fact the actress who plays sam in the movie shows up as a character in season two of the show oh really? yeah, yeah cool oh yeah spoiler alert my bad mark i forgot that you had oh, that's a little spoiler we're good <laughs> um but yeah So with the whole dynamic between Sam and Gabe, the climax of, I guess, their character arc together as a couple is at the end of episode 10. I mean, there's a lot that happened in the end of episode 10, but for these two characters in particular, it's Gabe saying to Sam, the more I think about it, the more I realize this isn't going to work. And I remember seeing that and I couldn't really understand why, like, okay, so what conclusion are you coming to after thinking about it that it's just not going to work you know you're not you're not saying anything to sam all you're saying is that you know the more i think about it it's not going to work but why i feel like a little more of an explanation wouldn't have hurt so that that part le- left me like scratching my head like what do you what do you mean after all this thinking because all you can do is think about her you said that you love her so anyway that's how i felt about it I, I'm kind of indifferent to them as a couple, you know, like, I, I don't know if like I ship them or anything is what I'm saying, but just for their character arc, I didn't really, I was kind of eh about how, how it ended for them in, in episode 10. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know how I feel about them together either, because <laughs> I, I personally feel like he would look, you know, he would do better with Joel if he wanted to date a different black woman on the show. In my opinion, I feel like their personalities mesh a lot better. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But Joelle made it clear to Gabe that she only wants to date someone black. I think she even said that at some point. Well, and she'd been making eyes at Reggie for a while. Which I didn't understand why she still was chasing him so hard. Well, not chasing him so hard, but crushing on him so hard when he had had history with her best friend. For me, that's a weird dynamic. Well, was Joel like clearly in the know that Sam and Reggie hooked up? Because when Gabe was asking, like, is something going on between them? Like, is that a thing? And then later at the end, when they're all watching uh, Defamation, mm-hmm. like she she asks, I think she asked Reggie, like, are you and Sam a thing? So I don't think like Joel even fully knew what was going on, you know? 
Yeah, that's questionable. I was just going to say, I think she had her suspicions. Yeah, she was definitely suspicious, but another couple, like another, I guess, power couple of the show is Troy and Coco. Mm. Um, I liked Coco a lot, and I will say with, like, the, the first thing that does kind of bother me about her, when she went to the blackface party, and we see Thane Lockwood, a drunk Thane Lockwood, come up to her and be like, how did you get the color so even? And then he um, wipes his finger on her face and then starts laughing his ass off. And Coco just rolls with it. She should have like kicked him in the nuts for that. Like you can't just put your finger on somebody like that. Come on. I, I, want, I wanted her to like, you know, punch him or do something. Don't just accept it, you know? Jesus. Well, Coco doesn't really show a lot of high self-esteem. So I can't say I'm too surprised. Some instances, she she seems kind of like she has a, a superiority complex, but then other times she just seems like she just hates herself. Coco's definitely interested in climbing the social ladder too. So I think she's kind of gotten used to holding her tongue a lot, even when she's really, really upset. She kind of plays politics, you know, at, at the dinner. She, you can tell some of the things that these donors are saying are upsetting her, but she doesn't speak out because she knows these are really powerful people and she wants to get in their good graces. So, yeah, I, I get that Coco plays politics a lot and she's very smart to like, no, like, you know, playing playing her, her cards close to the chest and everything. But in this instance, I wanted her to like actually not play politics and give give Thane what was coming to him, which is like a punch to the throat or a punch to the face or like a kick in the nuts or something in that particular instant. Anyway. Oh, yeah. I, I wasn't defending what she did as being right or wrong. I was just trying to explain what her mindset might have been. But, right, you know, right. I, I totally yeah. would have loved to see Thane get kicked in the balls or punched in the throat or something. I don't know. Yeah. Throw him down yeah. a stairwell. I don't care. He can take it. He's a football player. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I get that. That's that's in Coco's character. I just, in that moment, I wanted her to be out of character because that made me mad what Thane did. Um, yeah. Speaking but, of Thane, okay, I, I'm sorry, Jump to jump ahead just a little bit, who the hell protests binge drinking at a college campus? Like, that happened in episode 10. Like, one of the oh, counter yeah. protests. <laughs> and I was like, have you guys been to college? That's like, the, that's the only thing people do besides like study and get high and like yell at football players is binge drink like that's like a protest of new yorkers against pizza i was like why are we why are they even protesting that he would have loved that to begin oh, with yeah i think somebody even pointed it out to them like nobody loved binge drinking more than thane what the hell are you doing yeah <laughs> i'm sorry that was a tangent but well, it's technically an appropriate tangent because Thane dies from being drunk or something of the sort. Yeah, yeah, he dies early in like episode four or five or something. Listening to too much R. Kelly, I believe I could fly. Oh God. man, good God. <sighs> well, yeah. So Thane does that. Coco's at the blackface party. Um, she and Troy kind of become a thing. And I like Troy as a character, but I thought he was really cold in the next. I don't know if it was uh, the if it was a Coco episode or a Troy episode, but when she eventually finds out that he was having an affair with the professor, um, Neil Long, yeah, yeah, Neil Long. <laughs> it's also yeah, like throughout throughout the course of the story, it's also revealed that Troy pardoned Kurt because Kurt got footage of. Troy and the professor on camera and that's why he did that and Coco is smart enough to see the way Troy is behaving around the professor mm -hmm. and says you know you're very persuasive you got a professor to sleep with you and Troy's like how, how did you know and she's like you just told me so she's right so, yeah oh. <laughs> Coco's got a very high social intelligence she can read people like a book yeah yeah, social intelligence and emotional intelligence, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He treats her so harshly, like a few episodes or scenes later, like we see them again and I, they, they kind of have like an argument and she asks him, are you breaking up with me? 
and he says, we were never together. You don't even like me. You only like the idea of me. No, the idea of us. And she leaves after that. And I felt really bad for her because Troy was just kind of, he was kind of being a dick. I, I don't know. I don't know how else to say it, but he was being really, really mean to her. And I honestly thought maybe she she loved him and her heart was broken after that. She she may she may act like she doesn't care or that she can move on and everything, but I honestly felt like she loved him at that point. They did have a, a deep root in history because he was what the first person that flirted with her at the campus. Oh yes, like, oh yes, I forgot about yeah, that. They showed that flashback where he pulled her to the side and said something. Yeah. Their story arc is toward the end of the show anyway because Troy is supposed to be hosting a town hall in response to what happened to Reggie and Sam is planning a protest but there's a little bit of disagreement between all parties involved episode 10 is a mixture of all the main characters perspectives right it's not on any one particular character Mm -hmm. and things don't really go any particular character's way things don't go in Troy's favor they don't go in Coco's favor. They don't really go in Sam's favor. They definitely don't go in Reggie's favor because no, by yeah. by episode 10, nothing is done about what happened to him. Lionel kind of has a moment, though. Yes, that's true. Lionel has his moment. With the whole town hall and everything, I want to ask you guys, why do you think Coco locked the door into the building? Like, what what was the point of that? What was she trying to? Was she was she doing that purposely to sabotage Troy? If not, like, I don't. I, I was I was a little bit confused about that. Hell yeah, she did that to sabotage Troy. <laughs> he was the only one she was trying to block out because so that she that he can um get up on stage and do what she pretty much did he was supposed to do that she was just a host though she was passing the mic around yeah but he was supposed to do that and she told him oh your dad said to stay out there until you get the situation you know fixed up under control his dad never said that (laughs) exactly yeah she it was the opposite his dad was looking for him yep yeah she saw an opportunity to make herself look good and she grabbed it she yeah but she kind of stabbed someone in the back in order to get there well the guy had also didn't really give a fuck about at that point yeah and this was also a guy who had cheated on her with a faculty member so she probably felt like it was time for a little vengeance for real and plus knowing that she had dirt on him so Mm. he can't really say too much otherwise she can pull out his dirty laundry yeah right but she didn't have proof it would be her word against his. Kurt had actual proof. Sometimes you don't need the proof. Sometimes you need to just drop a little bit of doubt. And then now there's going to be a magnifying glass over the situation. Yeah. Very true. All right. Now, the the last person she calls on is Lionel. But that kind of flips her plan because Lionel asks a hard-hitting question about Armstrong Parker. So first off, Coco... What did you think was going to happen when you chose Lionel? You know he's super smart. What, what did you think? What kind of question do you think he was going to ask? Do you, do you think he was going to ask something in your favor? Why was she under the impression that Lionel was going to ask a question that was going to help her? You know? She probably saw Lionel and was like, what's the worst he could ask? <laughs> oh, yeah. This guy's a pushover. Ah, okay. Yeah, maybe that was her mindset, but probably, yeah. Right then and there is when Lionel leaks whatever old, you know, dug up newspaper he has to everybody at the university, including Troy, who then tries to bust into the building because it was locked, and then he gets arrested for it. Now, I thought maybe she was doing this to prove what Lionel was trying to post in the newspaper that, oh, just because. Troy is all perfect doesn't mean he doesn't go through the same things that Reggie would because right after he did that he was getting arrested he was getting arrested by the police officers he was standing behind you know I don't know if that was supposed to be symbolic of anything in particular but it felt kind of symbolic to me and 
his dad drops his guard completely. He starts, you could see tears in his eyes as he's running out of the building saying, don't shoot, don't shoot, that's my son. And I honestly felt that was kind of why Coco did that. It's like she knew that Troy would have to bust in or actually maybe not because she didn't She didn't know about Lionel leaking that story to everybody, right? Yeah, I don't think she did. Yeah, so I guess maybe she didn't expect Troy to bust the windows to destroy property, I guess, which is the the criminal act that happened there if you were to be charged. Yeah, I don't think she thought that plan out that thoroughly. That's how the season ends. And mm-hmm. that's pretty much pretty much it. Uh, Kelsey's dog, <laughs> her, her uh, therapy dog, it's kind of like a plot element in season two, but it's not really that important. It's just something, I guess, like a comedic relief element ah. in season two. Yeah. Okay, because here it's a running joke. Yeah, it's it's more of that. It's pretty much more of a running gag of season two. I didn't think it was that important. Realms, did you think the dog was that important in season two? Not really important. Yeah. Okay. Like I don't think anything that the dog did would have like it not being there would have affected anything. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, Jam. So since you're not in the know, without saying any spoilers, I will say that Sam's parentage does become more important in season two for sure. Mm. I'm just throwing that out there. Going into closing statements, I will say, like, again, going through this watch through, a lot of characters that I forgot were in season one um, were in season one, like uh, Brooke, who works at the same newspaper as Lionel. She's kind of a minor character in season one, but she's quite important in season three. Same with Muffy, who is one of Coco's best friends and was also at the party at Addison's house. I completely forgot that she was in season one, but she was, and she's also more important in the later seasons. More on closing statements. Um, Another thing about Sam and Gabe, when Sam said to Gabe that he did the right thing on calling the police, I don't agree. I don't think calling the police was the right thing. And I wasn't sure if Sam was just saying that, like she meant it, like she, she thought about it for a while and she decided that Gabe's heart was in the right place and the right thing to do was to call the police or if she was just saying that to win Gabe back I don't know but either way I don't agree I think that was just Gabe being incredibly ignorant and not being able to know you know know, what did you think was going to happen if the police showed up and saw something going on between a black student and a white student for you to not to be so ignorant to not at least predict the outcome of that that's a huge L so I, well, I dis- disagreed with, with Sam there. On that one, I, I felt like they were being a little bit too hard on him. Because, you know, he did, you know, it seemed like things were going south. He did call to get somebody to come through to break it up. There's no way he could have actually predicted, you know, that a gun was going to be drawn. Like, yeah, even yeah. if they know they have guns, you still can't predict that they're going to resort to using a gun in order to break it up around some college students. The reason why I, I think they're being too hard on him is because of like the way that the call actually played out. Like he didn't say, oh, you know, there's, you know, this black guy and this white guy fighting or anything like that. It was just, hey, something's bad is going on. Can you come through type call? Okay, maybe you're right. <laughs> maybe I'm being too hard on Gabe then. <laughs> it probably never occurred to him that that sort of thing could, could happen because you know, you'd, in his community, like he, he said, he's from New Hampshire, he's white. He probably doesn't know anybody in his age group who has had anything close to that sort of interaction with the police. And that's, I think that really just speaks to his privilege, you know? Yeah, that's the thing is that like, even if you grew up in an area where you don't see much of that, you know, just from being part of American society that there is systemic racism and that police brutality is a thing. Oh yeah, you do. And he was, he was unbelievably naive. Knowing about something and internalizing something are two different things. Like he was probably aware of police brutality, but he might not have ever put a face to it before that night. If you, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. probably going to remember. So I think it's, I think it's kind of like different too, as far as, you know, us watching the show and, you know, we're, we're able to see the different sides of him. And a lot of those kids, that you know, all they saw was oh, this white kid called cops and you know a black kid got 
the shit end of the stick. So it's like they don't know his character to be able to be like, all right, well, he didn't intentionally do it for terrible purposes. Whereas we're like, we see him and we know he had no ill intent, really. It's not like he's Kurt. I feel like Kurt, his type of character, if he called the police for story purposes, I feel like they would have made him act more like a, a villain, more, uh, oh, he got what he deserved type of thing. And that's that's not the type of person that Gabe is. Well, Kurt spent a lot of time instigating. Wasn't he instigating at that party? And he was also pushing Sam's buttons at the end when there was a protest at the town hall. He was like, mm. he said something like, Sam, look around you. Look at everything you've done. Has any of it made anything better? He says something, something like that. At least I, later in the story, they show he has more of a, like a, a little bit more of a human side to him. But like at this point in the story, he could easily be seen as somebody that would be like, yeah, you got what he deserved type thing. Mm-hmm. I think with well, with Gabe calling the police as opposed to Kurt doing it, maybe the writers were trying to show that people who are generally nice and considerate can still contribute to um, systemic racial injustice. Unintentionally. Yeah. Unintentionally. I, I, I think that's maybe what the writers were going for there. Because Gabe clearly didn't foresee the consequences of his actions but nevertheless he acted and reggie could have died yeah yeah it was like the story where you know lady calls the cops because you know she suspects something is going wrong at the neighbor's house and then next thing you know somebody's getting shot in their sleep so it's like it it happens sometimes you call the police for all the right reasons and all the all the wrong things can unfold well speaking to to privilege um I remember when Pokemon Go came out, I I never played it, but I had a lot of friends who played it. And I was reminded of uh, some unearned privileges that I've had in my life when that game came out, because there was a a black journalist who said, I don't feel safe playing this game because if a black man starts walking around into neighborhoods, he doesn't know well, people might freak out and call the police on him and that had honestly never occurred to me like because i i i walk around all the time like i I was almost infamous at stony brook because i would walk from like stony brook to port jefferson which is like three miles away and i didn't care you know what streets i took to get there and it it honestly never occurred to me that 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 was a privileged thing on my part because there are some people who legitimately wouldn't be safe if they walked into a neighborhood they didn't know well even if they weren't doing anything wrong but they were just playing a video game that's true but uh in the same breath you even like white people can be you know subject to something like that if you're in the wrong neighborhood you might walk up in a gang territory well yeah yeah i i i was thinking more in line of like college campuses and whatnot like uh, i think i think the writer was saying even in like quote unquote safe neighborhoods where there isn't much crime he said he wouldn't have felt safe if he didn't know the place well because somebody still might call the cops on him okay okay yeah i've had the police called on me when i was on my own property it's it's a pretty dumb story it was like there's a little stream next to my house and like i just ran over to it with my cousin because we were just like checking it out it was only like a few years that we lived here and someone called the police on us because there was, I don't know, suspicious activity, but we were on our own property. Yeah, that happened to me too. Like near my own house, I'm chilling uh, a little bit up the road. There's a little bridge, like I guess, what is it called? Like an overpass above the highway. And I was recording a video for YouTube. I was, this was when I was more heavily into doing music. So I was shooting a video and I guess somebody down from the highway seeing me you know bounce around recording and shit and so they ended up sending police up there to check and see if i was all right because they weren't sure if i was like somebody trying to jump off the bridge oh so they were like looking out for you when they dialed 911 there yeah okay and then thankfully the the officer was nice like um there there are some like it's crazy because sometimes it can be like such a, a simple situation And I know um, there was a time I accidentally hit the power button too many times on my phone trying to turn the volume down. And then it set off the 911 alert. (laughs) So now I'm panicking. I'm like, oh my God, like they called me. They were saying, they were asking questions. They were like, 
we may send somebody just to check and see if everything's okay. And it's like, you're nervous because if they send the wrong cop, shit could go south. Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. That is the reality we live in, unfortunately. And this show, you know, is in a lot of ways, it's a reflection of our reality. One thing I guess I didn't really like about the show is how it kind of shows life in just like as if it's black and white you know like i'm not black or white but i've seen racial injustice plenty of times while being an american so black people have it the worst in our society for sure but racism occurs in all different shades and what this show would would have been cool with this show would be seeing other like people's perspectives from other races as well like i think there was one asian character but she was introduced, it seems like, just to be an extra character. She never really had much development at all or like ha- much of a supporting character at all. And I completely forgot that there was an Indian character or a brown character. The, like when, But when I rewatched the show, I remember that episode with Gabe and Joelle when they're going around campus to recruit. There was this dude, I think his name was Mehar, who tried to hit on Joelle. That was kind of funny, but... Hey, there was that one Indian character on the show. I don't think I ever see him again, but we see that one episode dedicated to Gabe, but that's pretty much it as the white character throughout the rest of the show. And even in seasons two and three, we don't see much of anyone else, characters of any other ethnicity much. Mm -hmm. So I think that would have been cool Mm -hmm. for the dynamic that the show was going for. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Like they, they definitely did zero in mainly on black and white and they even showed the struggles of homosexuality even more than other ethnicities but at the end of season three i guess they showed maybe like a glimpse that they might start opening up and showing different backgrounds because al was mixed he was actually hold on i'm not 100 percent sure if he was mixed but they did show that he had spanish background so now at the end of season three spoiler They did show him go into a group that was mainly focused on the Latino community. Yeah, I have to admit that whole thing with the, I think that was season three, right? That kind of confused me because there is such thing as Afro-Latino. And Mm -hmm. I was thinking that, okay, if Al is Hispanic, he could just be Afro-Hispanic or Afro-Latino. There are people like that out there. You know, it's not, I don't know, I don't know why he would have to hide from it. I don't, I don't see how, like why AP would frown upon that being his heritage. But, you know, I don't, I didn't fully get that, to be honest. Actually, the movie kind of showed that a little bit because in the movie, when they started to like single out the pastiche kids, like they, they were kicking them out of the hall. Lionel didn't live in their hall, so they actually kicked Lionel out at that point. It wasn't until he moved in with Troy, then they started letting him stay in that hall. Mm, I see. Well, I mean, yeah, the fact that this show does also touch upon homosexuality and homophobia, I think that's also important to address. So it's good that this show had that element as well. Definitely, definitely. One other thing I didn't understand was the dorm room situation. Most of the dorm rooms had, like, roommates, but... Troy and Lionel seemed like they had rooms to themselves. They shared a bathroom, but they had entire rooms to themselves. Why Why was it just that? I mean, I guess Troy gets that special treatment because he's the son of the dean. But mm. how did Lionel <laughs> end up as the lucky student who gets the other room to himself? That's another thing they explained in the movie. Yeah, apparently uh, he used to room with Kurt, I think it was. And Kurt was kind of harassing him a little bit and... His jokes were a little bit too far, so Lionel was trying to find a new place to room, and he ended up getting roomed up with Troy eventually. I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if they ever say that in the show, though, but I could be wrong. No, they don't. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Well, beyond that, we were just speaking briefly about season four. One sad thing, and this is unfortunately, I guess one could say ironic, that uh, Jeremy Tardy, who plays Rashid, He's not coming back for the fourth season and he's saying it's because Lionsgate, who I think produced the show, he's he's citing racism against them because he was underpaid compared to some of the other actors. Oh, really? Yeah. 
it's unfortunate. And I, and I think because of coronavirus that season four is delayed anyway. I don't know if it was supposed to come out this year from the get-go. Maybe it was, but for, at the very least, I think season four is still on. But it's crazy how a show that's all about racism is being accused of racism by a black actor on the show. You know, it's crazy. Yeah. And unfortunate. I, I like Rashid as a character. He he played his part. It's going to be sad to not have him a part of the cast anymore, you know, especially like watching the show, knowing that there were politics behind him not being there. It's just, it's always kind of a distraction. Aside from that, moral of the story, check yourself, stay woke, be aware of your privilege. Sometimes it's not enough to not be racist. You got to know that you have privilege in this world that other people might not have. With episode five, what started it all was the use of the N-word. If you are not black, don't say it. Like with Addison, why do you want to say it? You gotta ask yourself that. Nobody's saying you're a racist just because you said it. Maybe you don't know that it's wrong to say it. Learn your lesson and be a better person for it. That's the moral of the story for me. You know, just be aware. Like everybody is also ignorant, but you know, try to learn, try to educate yourself. Do the best you can. Be good to each other. Preach. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't mean to preach. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I just kind of got in my feelings. Honestly, bro, this is reminding me of something else. When we were in high school in ninth grade, we were reading a book. I think it was called The Contender, and the main character in that book mm-hmm. was black. And in the book itself, there was a character who called him, like the main character, a skinny N word, but. The teacher who was, you know, reading the book out loud, he didn't say the word. He said, oh, you skinny. And he just paused. And I remember the year after that in 10th grade, we were reading To Kill a Mockingbird, which is a very famous book, right? And the Mm -hmm. N-word is said a lot there. And the teacher, both of these teachers are white, mind you, when the N-word was, you know, said in the lines of that book, she would say it, N-word lover, N-word lover. And that made me feel uncomfortable. Like, I know she's just reading a line in a book, just like an actor would be saying that, playing a racist character in a movie. Like, I get that, but that's yeah. in a movie. When you're in school and you're reading the book aloud, I don't think it's necessary to like hear that word out loud. And I wondered if I was the only person feeling that way. <laughs> I'm just saying it made me feel uncomfortable. So I remember raising my hand and telling her, can you please not say that? Like I specifically remember that. So did she stop? Yeah, I think after that she did. I don't remember the reason like why she was explaining why she was doing that. But again, at the same time, like I was saying earlier, maybe it wasn't in my place to have told her to stop saying it, you know, like I was feeling uncomfortable, but I'm not black. So maybe it wasn't my right to tell her to stop saying it, even though she was white. I mean, anybody who feels uncomfortable about anything has a right to at least voice how they're feeling. I feel like what she should have done was at least ask the class how they felt about it before doing it. I mean, you don't have to read these books out loud. It, it, I'm assuming this is like a middle school or high school level. High just school. have have the kids just just have the kids read it quietly. It's okay. You, like you, you don't have to recite it. Well, I mean, sometimes sometimes as a class we would read it out loud, and and yeah. I think that's fine. But in that particular instance, I don't think reading that word was necessary out loud. Like I said, the example I was giving right before that was in ninth grade, we were reading a different book called The Contender. It's not as famous as the two kilo. Oh, no. I, I read The Contender in middle school, yeah. Yeah. The boxing book. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And my ninth grade teacher, who was also white, he didn't say it when that word came up while we were reading it out loud. And I think he did the right thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, gentlemen, I'm going off another tangent. If you have any closing statements before we go into ratings. Um, not so much about the series, but um, I will say, you know, about your story, like uh, you weren't sure if you were able to speak on it. For all you know, you might have did it and somebody in the class may not have had the courage to actually do it. You know, you might have did them a favor by speaking up. Not everybody is brave enough to speak out and might feel like they might get alienated if they do so. There was a black kid in that class and he did say like, yeah, he he appreciated that I did that. And most of the rest of the class was white, I think, so. And it's, it's hard to, to stand out alone. I was just gonna say as closing statements go, um, I'm trying to educate myself 
I know I have a lot of privileges in this life, and I also know that I don't know the full extent of my privilege, if if that makes sense. So I'm I'm trying to read more, listen more, and engage with content like this show created by people of other communities. And I think it's important that everybody does that. Hey, the biggest thing is that you're open to those things and you're actually, you know, trying, you know what I'm saying? There's people out there, they don't want to hear anything. Like you can tell them no matter what you tell them, like they're set in their ways. So it's, it's nice to you know hear that you have an open mind. Yeah, thanks, man. I, I appreciate that. And I'm trying to keep it o- open. And I also know hundred percent, I'm going to fuck up sometimes. And I think the, we all, yeah, I, I think it's more important to respond to that well and try to change your behavior accordingly than to just not try to begin with, you know, yeah. nobody's perfect. Yeah. Well said JM. Like, yeah, the important, what, I, what I'm hearing from what you're saying is that you are self-aware and you're always trying to be better. And you know, that's, that's the best that you can do. That's the best that you can be. I'm trying, but, um, you know, even self-awareness has limits, you know, like there, there are invisible benefits out there. I'm sure I don't know anything about yet, but I mean, uh, you can, you can only do so much. I mean, we are all human. Like, like I said, we're all sinners. It's impossible to be human and not be a sinner. It's Im- also impossible to be human and not be flawed. You know, like we have our imperfections, but that's what makes us human. You know, that's what brings us together is the fact that we, we're all striving to be better people. Indeed, we are. <laughs> and I think that's, yeah, it's the best thing you can say about a person is that they're always trying to become a better person. Yeah. Trying to be. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I know I, yeah. I do some, I say and do some messed up shit sometimes still. Uh, but yeah, I try it to be better. Going into ratings, I think Dear White People is one of the best Netflix originals. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Which with the, the RDC world line. He said, he said, calm down, Jamal. Don't hit him with the 9. <laughs> guess what? I'm going to give it a nine too. As far as the first season, I'll give it a nine. If I had to judge further seasons, it would probably drop a little bit. Right, but, right. I mean, for the show as a whole, but we're we're only reviewing the first season. And for that, yes. nine. Yeah. Yes, nine. Well, we're going three for three because that's what I was going to give it to. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> nine, nine, nine. Triple nine. There we go. <laughs> Triple, that, that sounds like a movie, but... We all would recommend this then for our audience to check it out. The next episode will in fact be the final episode of season three of this podcast. Um, Yeah, we really (laughs) do this. And so we started this season with anime. We will end this season with anime. Or will we? Ah, twist. (laughs) All right, so what I have decided to do for my pick, I I had an anime ready, but I decided to switch it up. Oh. Oh. But it's anime related. Okay. Okay. So it's not an anime, but there will be subtitles. The movie is called The Monkey King, Havoc in Heaven's Palace. And it's based off of Sun Wukong, which is the god that Goku and Jin Mori are based off of. So it's kind of like a little bit of an anime history lesson, a little bit of anime backstory. Oh, was this the story that inspired part of the show then? or It's the story that inspired both of the main characters for the two shows. Gotcha. Cool. Great choice, man. Yeah, next week is going to be an interesting one. Yes, sir. Hell yeah. That just about does it for this episode of Movie Guys Improvise. You have been listening to Chill with Realms, Jurassic Mark, and for Hod Targaryen. Thank you all again so much 
for listening to us and catch us again next week. Chill energy only. Thank y'all for chilling with us. See you later, folks. We out, we out, we out, we out. All right.